you're never throwing something away. It, it's always going somewhere. It's just a matter of where that is and, and what happens to it. For more than 30 years, the government has addressed hazardous waste sites with a program known as the Superfund. Four years have passed since the meltdowns at the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan. It's been more than a week since three million gallons of toxic wastewater gushed from the Gold King mine in Colorado. That wastewater, filled with toxic heavy metals, has contaminated several rivers in three states. The Gulf oil spill is full of big numbers that tell their own story, so we thought we'd run through a few of them. 1,499 birds with oil on them have been found dead, but more than that, 1,699 visibly oiled birds have been collected alive, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Whether we see it or not, the potential impacts of its presence may plague us for decades. What are the environmental concerns specifically in, in these mines that are leaking? Cadmium, arsenic, zinc, they hang around, they settle into the bottoms of rivers. 600 miles, that's the number of miles along the Gulf coastline impacted by the oil. You're creating not only a, a, a ton, tons in fact, of greenhouse gases, but by burning it you also release uh, what's called dioxins, which are part of the EPA's dirty dozen uh, chemicals. But engineers still can't look inside the damaged reactors. The radiation is too harsh. We need to come up with a solution to where we're actually fixing it, not just kicking the responsibility down this toxic trail. What happens to this waste when it leaves the Superfund site and where it goes? So where does it go? We often think we're the center of everything, the center of all value, the center of all worth, the center of everything that really matters on this planet. We treat it as if we own it, as if it's a resource that can be endlessly processed, energized, extrapolated from to create an endless array of products and services and structures, like right outside the window here with the city of Philadelphia. We think that there's an endless source of resources that which can be used to create what we think is a life of comfort and luxury and desire and pleasure removed from the natural world which threatens most people. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, people have been dumping hazardous waste wherever they wanted to. So if you change the oil in your car, you might just dump it out behind your house. And, and people didn't think about it, about what the implications of any of this were. So you had these big mega companies that were doing the same thing. They're dumping their used whatever outside the plant and into huge lagoons or down drains or whatever. And nobody thought about it until probably the early 70s. It's a lot of people started getting sick in these areas. We had cancer clusters. And so there started to become more of an awareness of environmental uh, responsibility. The time has come for man to make his peace with nature. Let us renew our commitment. Let us redouble our effort. The quality of our life on this good land is a cause to unite all Americans. environmental agenda now before the Congress includes laws that deal with water pollution, pesticide hazards, ocean dumping, excessive noise, careless land pump, and many other environmental problems. It was such a big hit, like everybody loved it. Oh my God, let's start cleaning up all these sites. You know, what always surprises me is how, how few people actually know what the Superfund program is. The actual law is CERCLA. Comprehensive Environmental Response and Liability Act. That's a mouthful. So it's, it's shortened, it's called Superfund. And the name Superfund comes about from, the, the, it was a very large trust account that was established, primarily from taxes from uh, the petroleum and chemical industry. They realized that there was not enough money to clean up all these sites. Initially Superfund, the money for it came from a tax on people that produce chemicals that pollute and that are hazardous. There's going to be 
millions of dollars per site. Superfund formed as a result of what happened in, in two places really, but the one that gets uh, most of the attention, the publicity, is Love Canal, New York. People had green ooze coming up out of their lawn and into their basements and stuff like that. They couldn't figure it out. Turns out there was dumping facilities nearby that had been going on for years, 30, 40 years, 50 years, and nobody knew about it or, or didn't think about it. Would you please tell me? Do I let my three-year-old stay? They did have some uh, genetic testing done, and they found an enormous amount uh, of, of problems. So they took it to the Board of Health, and they were found that those people had chromosomal damage as a result of living there. And they, they were told, don't reproduce. And all of a sudden now we're, we're concerned with this environmental contamination. I am really, really afraid. Uh, we have decided we're going to get out one way or another. But right now, you know, you just can't jump and where, where are we gonna go? That's, that's how Superfund sites are found. You know, you have the tenacity of somebody who, from the general public, who, who, who says, you know, they become the thorn in someone's side and they don't give up. The Superfund sites, it's mostly, of course, industrial. You know, I mean, prior to 1980, people didn't know any better. And you, every town had a dump. And you took whatever kind of refuse you had to the town dump. There was really no dis, d discerning, uh, you know, okay, should this be going to a town dump or should this be something that should really go to an approved hazardous landfill? They didn't make that kind of distinction. It started when we had a society of scarcity and there was actually a lack of goods and a lot, and a lot of meat. And that was uh, quickly satisfied by the rise of industrial society and mass production, the mass production of cars, the mass production of housing, the mass production of all kinds of goods and services. And what has happened is, is that the levels of production and exchange have become so abstract, we don't see their origins and we only see their midpoint with us. You take a pill and your body metabolizes a good part of it, but a small amount of it is excreted in urine. And then it's flushed down the toilet. And then where does it go? People forget about it at that point. And we don't see their final destiny in a landfill. Some of the most common contaminants that you'll find at the thousand plus Superfund sites that there are would be your heavy metals. Uh, lead is very prevalent from battery breaking sites in this area. We also have a lot of sites with PCBs, with dioxins. A lot of asbestos, lead. Hexavalent chromium, cadmium. Polyaromatic hydrocarbons, also known as PAHs. Leaking underground tanks that are still there or mostly empty but with just a bit of the plume under the tanks. Basically, humans produce cleaners that are often hazardous. You know, something to clean rigorously has some heavy-duty chemicals. Trichloroethylene, which is a degreaser, also known as TCE. Uh, PCE, or PERC, um, tetrachloroethylene, is also popular. That was used in, mainly in the dry cleaning industry. We produce machinery that has a lot of organics on it that, if released to the environment, are hazardous. And, and those are typically the ones you see in these uh, train derailments that, you know, they go off the track and you know, tanker trucks of hexamethyl death, you know, go off and, and all of a sudden now it's up in the air, it's going at everybody's homes who are in the area. DDT, um, which is in the top 10 by the World Health Organization of persistent organic pollutants to not use. Gasoline, many of the things that we use every day, um, great for running engines, but not great for being, your body being exposed to it in any way. Hello folks, I'm a carbon atom, 
And since I'm an essential part of each of the hydrocarbons in crude oil, I'm here to give you the inside dope on gasoline. We store these in big tanks, big steel tanks under the ground that are touching the groundwater. Hmm, water and steel, what could go wrong? Things that we build that have metals in them, if they get exposed to an environment where they can get corroded, eventually that can get um, into water. Then where do people get their drinking water? From the Delaware. So it, it, they don't just pump directly from the Delaware into your home. It's treated first to remove bacteria, but not to remove you know, th these, these particular kinds of compounds. And people put 500 gallons of fuel oil in their tank for their house, and then you know, two months later, half of it's gone, and it's summer. And they're wondering, geez, I can't believe I used that much fuel oil in a couple of months, you know? But they don't think about it, and they just keep filling the tank and filling the tank, and all of a sudden, somebody somewhere notices I've got oil in my well water. So you've got to look at, at how quick a chemical can kill you. Um, chlorine gas, for example. I mean, I've been, in, I've been in facilities that you have to carry an escape mask, a five-minute escape mask. So if something happens, you put that mask on, you've got five minutes of air, and you've got to get out of there. There is a new emerging class of compounds that's insidious. Liver damage or skin rashes. Feminization of frogs sheep had turned green. Many of the chemicals are considered carcinogens. The reproductive abnormalities in, in birds of prey. 10, 20, 30 years, maybe you'll get cancer of the whatever. Children born with all kinds of abnormalities. The EPA ranks these things on a hazard ranking system, so they determine long-term health effects, short-term health effects. Once you hand over land to the public, they forget what it was used for. The memory, you would think, oh, 10, 20, 30, 100 years, we'll keep track. Within one or two years, people forget what the land was used for. What's out there? What's the chemical? What's the media it's in? You know, how's it traveling? Is it in the ground? Is it in the groundwater? Uh, who's it affecting? Everything has its own treatment system or method. The heavy metals, they tend to migrate at a much slower rate. They'll, they'll stay more at the, the soil surface as compared to some of the other compounds like trichloroethylene, which will you know, percolate down and get into the groundwater. The only way we can see what's going on in the groundwater is to drill wells that it's, it's expensive and it can be intrusive and we don't have very many of them. Historically we would pump and treat groundwater and run it through a treatment plant. Some contaminants um, release a vapor and you can track them in the soil zone by looking at the soil vapor. We use a lot of uh, microbes. More recently we've been doing things what's known as in situ or in place or in the ground. To clean up TCE as an example a lot of times we'll inject lactose or we'll inject um, another nutrient which actually feeds the bacteria which are naturally present and then the bacteria break down the chemicals. We had a lead site where lead and ground water, we cleaned it up by injecting baking soda mixed with water into the aquifer. And what that did, it changed the lead from a soluble form where it was in the groundwater to an insoluble form where it locked it up into the formation of the soil and the bedrock. When we study contaminants in the lab, we tend to look at one rock and one contaminant at a time. In the real world, you have a mixture of contaminants and they may interact in an unusual way and the contaminants can encounter many different rock types and soil types and that adds so much to our complexity so we don't, it's, it's invisible because it's underground and it's very complex. That's kind of a double whammy. I do not like the amount of money that's spent on lawyers trying to get out of doing things. I think that we have wasted a lot. I know that we've wasted a lot of Superfund money on that. So I'll get a company that says to me, well, we've got this big problem. And again, what's it going to take to clean it up? What's it going to take to fight it? And, and they go with the bottom line. If it's cheaper to fight it, I'm fighting it. 
And I'm sitting there as a the consultant going, no, you gotta clean it up. Like, oh my God, what are you doing to the earth and people? And think about it. It was a very large trust account that was established, primarily from taxes from uh, the petroleum and chemical industry to, um, to go into this trust account and only ever have to be used if they couldn't locate whoever did the polluting, whoever owned the land, and, or if they were unwilling to pay. And in one of Congress's we don't want to tax industry modes, they got rid of that tax. So now everybody in the country has to contribute to our overall taxes and a small piece of those can go to Superfund. So Superfund competes with every other federal program now instead of having its own tax. That put cleanup at a big disadvantage. There was a lot of problems because the people who live near these sites were upset that, uh, you know, I'm uh, disadvantaged or, you know, uh, I don't have a lot of money and therefore all these sites seem to be placed near me. You know, this is not my backyard type situation. Everybody is paying as opposed to the companies that are producing the chemicals. And one of the things you might say is, well, then those companies are going to charge people more. If you're using those chemicals, you probably should be charged more. And what disincentive does anybody have to find a cleaner way to do the things we do if we don't put some kind of a tax penalty on them? One of the things we look at during the investigation of the site is both the current use and the potential future use of the site. And we try to work that into our model and our conceptual design on how we're going to clean up the site. We know we need to clean up hazardous waste sites, but maybe some of them don't need to be cleaned up as much as others. And we, if we do that, we could spend less money and get them back into use sooner. We're currently looking at several sites right in the Philadelphia area, uh, Franklin Slag Pile being one of them. It's currently located fairly close to the Delaware River, which raises a lot of concerns. Unfortunately, the metal content is so high, it's difficult to keep the metal from leaching out of the slag. And now we're evaluating other alternatives because the community and the state and the city was opposed to our original plan. One of the things that's important to realize is that the EPA does not own this property. So we have to work with the current owners as well as with the community to see what the future use of the site could be. So right now you can go from the art museum down to close to Partram's Garden through um, two sites that were formerly contaminated and they've been cleaned up and now they're ready for reuse and redevelopment. It's very rewarding when you actually clean up a site and you work with the community and you see the direct benefits for the community and the people that are living there. We've built an entire civilization that has pushed the natural world and the starry skies further and further away. I think there's potential there for encouraging social responsibility. Pick one Superfund site, learn a little bit about it, find out what it was used for in the past. You know, what kind of contamination is there? What's been done about it? You know, what are some of the impacts? And, and then what are some of the health consequences of the various contaminants that are there? So we have rules about how to get rid of chemicals. We don't have as many disincentives to not produce them, perhaps, as we should. There are companies and nations who want to go to the moon and strip mine it and bring resources back. So we would actually be bringing the moon back and using energy sources that we would be burning into our atmosphere or to use to make products that would then end up in landfills here. You learn about Superfund sites, primarily from people like us. Um, you just have to be observant, that's all. We don't always know there's a problem until it gets, has gotten pretty big. And it's not so much the Superfund sites that we know of that are cause for alarm, although they can have problems resurface, and they have had problems resurface. It's the Superfund sites that still haven't been given that ranking of Superfund that we have to worry about, that are just around the corner that people just don't know about yet.